Hey everyone, we're so thrilled to welcome you to the first session of Level Up 2021. We've got a super exciting day planned out for you, full of amazing content and speakers. I'm Amy Meehan, VP of Growth Partnerships at IronSource. And to kick things off, we've brought Clive Downey, Chief Marketing Officer at Unity, in for a chat about the biggest trends in the games industry today. Let's get started. Um, but before we get started, I wanted to start with something a little more personal. Uh -oh. um, and I wanted to ask Clive how your face came to be on the cover of a 1990s EA video game. So um, you must be talking about Skitchin, which uh, was a roller skating game, it might have been roller blading game. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was on the Sega Genesis or as Europe knew it, the Sega Mega Drive. And um, how did I come to be on it? Well, I, when I started in the games industry, uh, the games industry was a lot smaller and it didn't necessarily have all of the sophistication that it does today in terms of the many departments that are involved in bringing in games to market. So I was in QA and customer service at the time, and I was friendly with the marketing leader for the game. And he said, we need to make the front cover of this look a bit hipper than we currently have planned. Nice, nice. You're, you're a young 17-ish looking hip person. Yep. Uh, you should be on the front. So um, that's how it happened. And I am forever memorialized on the front of a game uh, <laughs> that uh, I am um, often teased about by friends and family. Um, but uh, it, was a, it was a bit of an honor. And now I look back on it and think, Wow, I can't believe yeah. that happened. Nice, and I guess, you know, I mean, you've held a number of, of leadership positions at a bunch of different companies like NG Moco and uh, DNA, Zynga EA. Um, I guess, you know, reflecting back, is that was that a childhood dream to get into the games industry? Was it a stroke of good luck? How did that, how did you come to be in the games industry? Um, well, I loved playing games as a, as a young person in England. And, um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say I actually had my hopes and dreams set on being in the games industry. I kind of fortunately fell into it because it was this wonderful time in the early 90s when they would hire people like me without college degrees who just showed interest and aptitude nice. and energy and enthusiasm for the content. Right. And they'd give you the opportunity to be on the, uh, the you know, first rung on the ladder of a career. And I kind of grew with the industry. You know, I worked right. hard and uh, had grit, I think yep. as you call it. Yep. But I was certainly in the right place at the right time. And I think that's, uh, you know, I was very fortunate to, to, to be able to surf the wave of uh, the gaming business and be in the right place at the time, work hard and work for some amazing leaders who, yeah. um, you know, saw something in, uh, in a young country boy from England who has since been able to strung together this uh, amazing uh, good luck series. Yeah, well, kind of given the long tenure in the space, you know, what, I guess that leads me to my next question, which is like, what leads you or what inspires you or what kind of gets you excited about our space? Well, what inspires me today about the gaming space is um, what ins has inspired me for decades. It hasn't changed and I am as inspired by it today as I ever was which is really, you know, after all of the business, mm -hmm. after all of the systems and the process and the revenue creation and the stats, um, we're in the business of uh, putting fun and entertainment in front of humans, in right. front of people. Mm -hmm. And there aren't many places and categories and industries in the world that do that. And um, that's a fundamental to this business. And you know, we've seen over the course of decades how that's just grown. It's grown from being a, a small uh, category that was the domain of certain types of people and players, right. um, the domain of certain types of products, to now uh, it counts billions um, right. as, as its consumer base. And it counts uh, you know, hundreds of thousands as its creators, millions of its creators, and it's you know, that's what inspires me today is it's still the place that people can have dreams and they can share those dreams with other people who they wish to be their consumers. Yeah. So that's a, that's a pretty magical thing. And that, that it still inspires me to this day. I think that, I mean, what you're touching on is like the, the record kind of growth that we're seeing, right? The, the consumers coming into the space across all platforms, right? Mobile, PC, console. Um, I guess to that end, where do you see 
um, uh, the next level of growth and engagement coming from? Is it, is it mobile? Is it PC? Is it cross-platform? Well, I think the, the next level of growth and engagement um, is still yet to happen in mobile. Um, you know, mobile is an immensely scaled and voluminous category, still at just over 2 billion now. But there are areas in the world where it is still underdeveloped. Um, there are still uh, generations coming up who are receiving their first device. Right. Um, and so the opportunity for it to go both horizontal in terms of its scale and scope, but then vertical in terms of its depth, um, in terms of engagement and yeah. how, how many minutes a day people are uh, consuming content is still to grow. Right. So, you know, I, I think mobile is still at the vanguard of where we see gaming growth. Um, it's great to see PC coming back and PC having a resurgence. You know, certainly at Unity, we've seen uh, an ongoing growth of PC developers. Um, and that's interesting to see. You know, and, and next generation consoles are, you know, just going through their first full year now of uh, new adoption. Mm -hmm. And it's great to see that new wave of um, consoles become adopted. And it's gonna be a larger console generation than it was the previous generation. And that was the, a larger one than the generation before right. that. So there's growth happening everywhere. You know, I am, um, and, and that's, that's the one thing that continues to excite me on top of the thing I talked around, around inspiring right. In, right. In, in gaming, around kind of its dreams and connecting dreams with people is, there's still so much to happen in this space, right. be it new kinds of experiences that immerse people more, new kinds of devices that bring people greater levels of immersion and social cooperation, mm -hmm. um, new ways of discovering content, uh, new ways of monetizing content if you're in the business. So probably more to be written in this space than has been written. Right. And that's, uh, that makes it another, inspire, you know, another level of ins inspiration to be in it. Um, Speaking of monetizing content, I think on the subscription side, we were talking a little bit about um, the fact that Netflix had recently announced they were uh, deciding about whether or not to launch a game subscription service. And, you know, you've already, we've already got a lot of subscription services in the space, like whether that's Microsoft and Xbox with Game Pass or, or Apple Arcade. I'm kind of, I'd like to get your thoughts on, on what you think of subscription services for gaming content specifically. And then with some of those new entrants, whether that's Netflix or Amazon with Luna or Google with Stadia, what does it look like for them? Well, I think subscription is a natural uh, progression of how game content can be consumed. But I think what we're seeing uh, in this first wave, essentially, of game subscription services is the intent to do something different, but yet maybe the delivery mechanism and the um, value proposition for the consumer still being held back by potentially the cost of mm. the infrastructure and the cost of serving games uh, to consumers in different ways that suit the subscription model. So what you've got is you've got a kind of a juxtaposition of the old way of serving games, yeah. um, which is not dissimilar to if I download it or I have to buy it up front, yeah. um, but yet wrapped up into a new pricing model. Really what needs to happen is the pricing model needs to be able to provide a new way of consuming a product, um, which in turn will spawn a whole host of opportunity for how developers can think about making specific product hmm. for subscription channels that might actually allow people to consume games in different ways. As an example, pay to play. Yeah. So I'm actually consuming based, I can turn a game on and off uh, based off of how I wish to consume it um, and only be charged for what I consume. Mm -hmm. um, that would be quite an, an important opportunity for, to get to in the world of streaming. And do you think that that's a, a compelling business model for the game developers, right? Do you think that that's something that they can make a business out of, of getting paid on minutes versus you know, in-app purchases? Well, I think or... they can uh, make, a, make a potentially, uh, hypothetically, um, game developers could make a, a business out of it if the cost of operating it was low enough. Got and, it. you know, the, the problem today is what you see is um, all of the preeminent streaming services, actually all they're doing is they're computing the game on a server, mm. the full game on a server. They're running the full game on a server. 
And then they're streaming those frames of the game down mm -hmm. uh, the Wi-Fi to a device yep. which uh, just projects that. And then you interact with the device and the control input is sent back to the computer in the cloud. Right. And that's, a, that's actually a very expensive thing to do because you're running a GPU and a CPU in the cloud. And um, it's one of the reasons why most of the streaming services, um, most of the streaming services need you to actually buy the game up front yep. before you can play it and, uh, in a streamed way. And that's what I mean by you know, streaming services just actually provide games in the way that people are already used to paying and playing for games. Right, right, right. So uh, what needs to change is how games are uh, processed in the cloud, um, because then that will drive the cost down. And then that will spawn new business models and new ways for designers and developers to create games. Got it. Um, I think I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk a bit about kind of emerging markets and um, and understanding kind of the approach that you know that Unity takes <clears throat> to identifying emerging markets. And then um, you know how do you how does Unity support like the global game developers in those emerging markets? Well, we're very fortunate that there are probably no countries in the world where there are not Unity developers. So, you know, one way of classifying emergence is, does something happen or does it not? Well, there is game development happening in most countries in the world. Uh, the ones that we would not have data on are probably prohibited from a regulatory perspective because of certain laws that don't kind of allow, uh, you know, products to be sold in them. But so, so, is there anywhere there on where there are no game developers? No, and that's great because game development has become something that everyone can do. We're right. very proud of the place that Unity has had in that. What we really see though, is the opportunity for the emergence of kind of the scale of development, taking it from something that's nascent and done by the few and the early adopters and really making it into um, an, maybe an, in, an industry, an industry in that country that can support revenue generation for the growth, for the people who are, who are in that industry. It can provide a livelihood for those people. Mm -hmm. And it's a career choice for those people. Right. And we see that starting to happen more and more in areas that have trailed behind the West and, and Asia specifically. Um, specifically, Sub-Saharan Africa, specifically India, um, specifically Southeast Asia, all those three areas and the countries within them, we're going to see rapid growth over the next uh, nine years to 2030 of those countries within those areas being able to su support um, proper industries of game developers yep. um, who have chosen game development as a career and um, their games being played both in those areas and it globally uh, by people who um, are voluminous enough to, to support that, their, their, their career choice. And the reason why we, we see this is, you know, one of the things at Unity that we're very passionate about is supporting those grassroots ecosystems where we're starting to see the, the burgeoning growth of those industries. And it starts with education. It starts with educational establishments in higher education in those countries, bringing game development into the curriculum and seeing game development as a viable curriculum choice, so therefore a viable choice by students, then what you get is students leaving higher education with not just theory, but practical skills. Right. They then wish to go into careers. Yep. They go into careers, they start with their friends, and, uh, and you're starting to see the points of light of that happening, which we think you know, is a road of the next nine years, which will end in... You know, 2030 in those areas being very viable emerging markets, both from a development ecosystem and a consumer ecosystem. Because again, what happens in those markets is Generation Z actually becomes in 2030 in those markets the most voluminous part of their population sure. in terms of the workforce. Yeah. Yeah. And so they're the consumers with money. So right. you get this convergence of people making games in those markets, consumers who are technical literate becoming the majority population in those markets. And then you just see... Yeah. A, a wonderful uh, uh, effect because of that. So you're really talking about kind of a much larger investment in infrastructure and like almost at a, a, a government social economic policy level. Yeah. yeah. So that those those emerging markets can That's have a right. chance. Okay. I mean, it's all it, it, it's all part of this notion of yeah, at the beginning we mentioned 
there's just far more to happen in the game space than has happened. Right. Right. Yes, we see it as this voluminous industry of 140 plus billion a year right. played by over 2 billion people, but it's a, it, it's a leading economic force in the world now. It's yeah. no longer in the shadows that it was three decades ago in the sure. domain of the niche. And so because of that, um, you've, you've got countries, educational boards looking at it saying, we, we need game creativity in our country. Yeah. This is, you know, this is a major economic factor and a force for growth and economic growth in this country. So then what they do is they work with the educational establishments and then you know, that flywheel effect that I talked about starts happening. Okay. And then you just happen to have the consumer base anyway that are already playing games, right? Right. They already have the device in the phone yeah. and they're just gonna become more and more scaled. I think kind of, you know, to that end, you know, speaking about future trends a little bit, um, you know, what do you think that we should be seeing in the next couple of years? Like, do you see like greater adoption of VR applications? Do you, do you see, you know, innovations happening as a result of 5G. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about the metaverse before yeah. we got here. Um, kind of what does that look like in the next yeah, couple of well, years for well, you? I'd I touch on uh, maybe three areas of kind of trends that, you know, we think about at, at Unity um, and we, you know, we, we don't have the, uh, the license on the trends, every, the trends sure. that everyone has, sure. everyone, everyone yeah. can see. But um, the, the first is the increase in user generated content as a, um, you know, a, a, a phenomenon happening in games that is not just going to be the domain of modding in PC games, but user-generated content in, in, in mobile products as well. And we'll I'll talk a little bit about that. The second is, uh, you know, it's a trend which is growing and it's, a, it's, it's not kind of if, it's just when, and that's augmented reality as a consumer device mm -hmm. uh, outside of just phones, because every phone now mostly has AR in it anyway. So. Sure. And then the third, I think, is from a trend, that, and this is just gonna come about through necessity, is discovery of games. So let's just talk a little bit about them. <laughs> yeah. Shall we? Cool. I know, should we yeah, just talk yeah. through them? <laughs> yeah, 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 UGC. Let's talk about UGC. Now, um, people want to make things. They, people want, want to yeah. make things. People, generally, Everyone is, um, everyone is capable of creativity, but the bar to entry of creativity um, is often quite high, right? Um, and usually what happens in any market is the creativity starts with having uh, very sophisticated tools to use. And that's a barrier to entry. Yep. And it's no good to be able to give the mass population blank a blank canvas and say, there we go, we make something. Sure. That just scares people amazingly. I, mean, I don't know right. about you, but whenever, you know, sure. hey, here's a blank piece of paper and a pen, can you draw something? Uh, no. I kind, of, <laughs> I kind of know what a house or a landscape might look like in my head. Right. But having to put it down on paper, blank, not gonna really happen. scary. Yeah. And if I do do it, I'm going to look at it and go, that's rubbish. <laughs> and throw it away. Right. So everyone has it, and it's about unlocking what the creativity is. Now you're starting to see kind of the different eras and generations of that. So if you go back to the PC world when PC was dominant, modding was the preeminent way of harnessing people's creativity or gamers' creativity. But modding on PC and even today is actually quite hard to do. You still have to have a rudimentary to basic uh, degree of coding and scripting skills. And you have to be able to understand the architecture of a product and which asset goes here and you know, which assets can I change, et cetera. That's really, that's really quite hard. Um, but that was, the, that was the forefront, tip of the iceberg. What you've since seen is products like Minecraft, uh, products like Roblox, um, you know, wonderful products that have started to go to the next level mm -hmm. of providing creativity and the ability to make user-generated content to a broader audience. Sure. But even those products, uh, you take Roblox as an example. Roblox is a wonderful product and they're a great company full of wonderful people. But, you know, you still need to use a studio-based product mm -hmm. that's separate from the actual play product to make things. And that authoring tool has still got quite high levels of um, friction to it, which is why you don't see a majority of the people playing Roblox also creating and bringing their own creativity to bear. So I think our sense is there's a next generation to happen as well. 
which is how do you further lower the tools of creativity to allow, you know, maybe even the next uh, unlock to happen, which, you know, why, why can't people make things on mobile? Mm -hmm. Why can't you modify the games that you're playing on mobile? Sure. Uh, maybe as you play them, right? What, what would that look like? Right. And then if you did that, that would create a whole lot of content that was user generated that people could do many things with. You could share it with friends and think about how do you create things together, right? Social creativity. So you've gone beyond social gameplay and now you're in social creativity. Imagine what could happen based off of that flywheel. And then you can unlock maybe creator economies. If I'm making and modifying a game and bringing my own objects to it that I've doodled, mm -hmm. do people want to buy those objects for usage in their games? Sure. Right? So it's about lowering the accessibility, um, lowering the friction of accessibility um, for a broader aperture of people um, that potentially could be on mobile. And so you start to see these nascent things happening. If you look around, there's, there's many apps yeah. starting to happen to deal with um, user-generated content and fueling that need right. in that volume-scaled world of mobile. So really exciting as a trend. Hmm. We'll see where it goes. We're, you know, we're exploring where it can go sure. as well. <clears throat> Second one is, is we're only on number two. Yeah, I was going to say, that. maybe they can make some ads for us. Maybe we could have user-generated ads. Well, potentially. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, the, the, the best, uh, the best <laughs> Sales force and advertising force is always the people That's who right. are playing the game. Right. 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 Consumers are always the best people. Mm -hmm. Word of mouth. Mm -hmm. So exactly. who knows? Maybe. Exactly. Maybe. But you know, it's going to give greater opportunity for the likes of advertisers uh, because it, it, there's more engagement. There's sure. Be more engagement. Sure. More content. More engagement. More fun. Right. Good for everyone. Everyone mm -hmm. wins. Uh, the second uh, opportunity or trend is augmented reality, um, and I said it's not a matter of kind of if. It's just when. Sure. Um, so the, the, you, know, you kind of join the dots. The augmented reality already exists on our phones. Um, and if you think about it, that's training 2 billion consumers to already understand the conventions of what can be rendered on top of the real world. That's right. right? Now, the conventions might be a Pokemon because mm -hmm. it's Pokemon Go. Sure. But it's still getting people to think, oh, the real world can be augmented with other right. data. Yep. So that's good. That's almost like kind of hand-holding people to understand augmented reality. And um, you know, I think over time, what we're going to see is augmented reality becoming an ever-increasingly important part of our world insofar as how it brings information via a potential new era of devices directly to people based off of semantic data that understands who they are, where they are, what their interests are, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And that's an exciting moment for um, content creators because it provides an opportunity for more content creativity. It's an exciting moment for uh, potentially advertisers to provide contextual advertising in the moment to people. 100%. Um, yeah. And you know, I think, we'll, we'll, like I said, it's, it's if not when. So we'll see where that goes. You know, we're very fortunate to power close to 70% of all augmented reality today. So you know, we, we've got a front row seat to hmm. lots of things that are happening. So we're, we're excited about that, but let's see where that goes. Um, and then the third one was, I think, discovery we talked about. Well, yeah. you know, discovery is still the holy grail of um, opportunity to solve in this, especially in the mobile market. So, you know, how do I link my customer with the right product at the right time? For sure. Um, there's a very efficient set of advertising mechanism that do it, obviously. We're very fortunate to have one of those uh, systems as well at Unity. And that's one way of solving for discovery sure. is you can fast track yourself to the right customer. Mm -hmm. Not going to go away. But the, the actual destination where people are downloading and discovering content when they're not clicking on an ad, hmm. stores, et cetera. Um, you know, but we think that there's an opportunity there potentially for evolution, um, more community focused, richer stores, um, stores that perhaps potentially can further optimize uh, for people's time and interests and link developers 
more directly to their consumer base. So they can actually have relationships with their consumers mm -hmm. earlier on in the development cycle of product, mm -hmm. right? So that they can do what really developers want to do, which is what we constantly empower them to do every day, we, we think and we strive for, which is just to make a better product. Yeah. Make a product that more people enjoy. And um, so we think there might be a fusing of the two that could happen. And so more community, more developer um, uh, um, relationships happening actually at the point of sale. So, you know, I think that's a trend to keep an eye on as well, especially as, you know, maybe store ecosystems potentially open up because mm -hmm. of some of the activity that's happening in the broader, in the broader space. And yeah. they're already very open on something like Google. I mean, Google, the, Android, the Android ecosystem is a very open place. Right. So, uh, you know, we, maybe we think there's a lot, that, a lot that could happen there. Interesting. Do, I mean, do you see a situation for um, iOS? Like, how, how do you address the iOS discovery challenges, either through the store or even some of the things with related to the changes of, you know, 14.5? Um, you know, how, do, how does someone navigate that? Yeah, that's a massive question <laughs> that probably takes another 60 minutes. Sure, but, um, sure. Look, I, I think, I, I think with IDFA especially and with iOS 14, um, that's just one of the obstacles that, have, that has been put in the path of game developers sure. for time immemorial. That's right. right? Uh, it, and I'm not, I'm not being blasé about it. It happens. <laughs> These things happen. Um, and we have to adapt. And we, and we have, have to, to adapt. Right. We have to evolve. The, and, and again, this is not a throwaway comment by any means, because I, I know firsthand how hard it is to make things. <laughs> right. But it's really all about the content. It's, it's really all about the content. Right. So, you know, if you, if you make a great game and you spend time focusing on a great game. People will find it. People your will audience find will it and your audience will be found. Yeah. And if you use the services that are open to you, the services from the likes of Iron Source, services yeah. from the likes of Unity, that are designed to make your life easier at connecting you with the right audience so you can focus on the creativity, then, um, you know, I think, I think you, 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 you have a great shot at being successful. And we still see that at Unity with the amount of data that we are able to get from what's happening in the ecosystem. Right. You know, that we're not seeing a decreasing number of new games launched, right? right. We're, right. we're not seeing that happen every yep. single month. We're seeing an increasing number of new games launched. We are still seeing a large number of downloads of games. I mean, we're fortunate right. enough to have 5 billion downloads a month of Unity powered games. Right. That number's not shrinking. Shrinking. Right. So new games isn't shrinking. Uh, downloads, which is a you know, proxy for consumption right. and people finding games, is not shrinking. Right. And so, you know, the, the industry's compensating. Right. It's, it, and it's compensating because it's always compensated. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it's a sea change for sure, I think, for, for marketers. But to your point, right, you make a great product, people will find it. Um, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I see it as a, a way for us to have to adjust and evolve. But, and we will, right? And that's, that's the nature of our business that we're in. It's super dynamic. Um, we didn't even really talk too much about some of the consolidation that we've even been seeing, some of the trends around, you know, ad tech consolidation, right. studios acquiring each other. Um, anything interesting there? Well, look, I, um, even today, right. uh, I saw uh, news of an acquisition, Take Two. Take mm -hmm. Two acquired Nordius, a right. wonderful Serbian um, developer right. of a, of a great uh, soccer management game mm -hmm. that I spend too much time on myself. <laughs> and, um, you know, so we saw that happen. That, now, consolidation, consolidation happens in every market. Um, when consolidation is a bad thing, it's in stale, stagnant markets where consolidation is happening as a, as a result of kind of needing to energize the market. Right. Right, right. There is no upward mobility in those markets. By that, I mean there is no kind of burgeoning, new, energized startup activity happening. You know, it's just kind of this, it's fallow at the lower end of the market. Right. That's not what happens in games. What's happening in games, and this is why consolidation in games right now is actually the sign of a healthy business, 
a healthy market is, you know, you, you, it, there is still thousands of new entrants into the market on an annual basis in terms of people saying, I have a dream. I'm going to try and take my dream to people. Yeah. I've got the tools to be able to do it. I've got the service providers that can help me. Um, I'm going to go for it. That's happening. Right. And then what you're seeing at the top end of the market is large, successful companies, and they're successful because of the vibrancy of the game space, mm -hmm. um, looking to put their capital to good use. They're like, well, I can build or I can buy. Right. I'm going to buy. And the only reason they can buy companies like Nordius, as an example, is because Nordius has been successful because of the vibrancy of the market. And yeah. that's a really healthy sign. Yeah, it's a nice flywheel, isn't it? It's a great flywheel. Yeah. So, you know, I think, I think consolidation in, in that respect and in the market that we live in is the sign of, of health. That's great. Um, I think I wanted to um, round out uh, our talk with a speed round of questions if you're up for it. Oh, I thought it was another game with me on the front of. I thought you, no. found, you, found, a, you found another one. There's been one that's since we've been talking, you've, you're on several, oh, several I'm sure, boxes. I'm sure I'll be a meme for, some, for something. This is definitely going to be a meme. Um, OK, speed round of questions. So uh, starting with the obvious, what game are you playing right now? Well, I'm playing uh, Top 11 on my phone. Yep. Uh, I'm playing Genshin Impact on my phone. Okay. Uh, I'm playing Valheim on PC, and my son. Oh, and I'm playing Call of Duty Warzone on PC, and my one of my sons has just convinced me to play uh, F1 2020 on PC. Um, I love playing games, That's... so I play. I, I love it. And when I say he convinced me to play it, he didn't take yeah. too much convincing because I love racing games. I've played F1 games in the past, but he's just got into F1. And so it's kind right. of like discovering the sport again right. with him. Of course. So there we go. Through, through a child's eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have, um, you have a favorite game? I don't have a favorite game. Okay. I'm not very good at favorites because okay. I like so many things. Good. But no, I don't have a favorite game. Sorry to disappoint you. No, no, it's cool. With that, um, I want to thank Clive for joining us today and um, want to um, Wish everybody the best with Level Up, and I hope that you enjoy uh, the Level Up program. Thank you.